Good to have you with us today. We're going to be looking at a, a text in Romans chapter 5. We're going to, as I said, you've heard me say before, we're kind of flying through this. There's a lot here. I would encourage you to spend some time in this text, probably one of the more uh, rich texts of the Apostle Paul's writing in the book of Romans. Uh, we'll get to some of the verses. We may not hit your favorite verse in this text, and that's okay. That's why you can read it. It's just, this, there's a lot here. As I was sharing with Dave earlier, there's probably at least five or six sermons that I could come up with out of this. Uh, so, but I'm only going to do one today. Is that all right? You don't want me to do five. Well, we got Lord's Supper. We don't have time for five. I don't think I can do five ser- sermons in 25 minutes. That would be pretty scary. So anyway, go ahead and turn in your copy of God's Word, Romans chapter 5. And if you join me as we read the text here, just a few moments, Romans 5, verses 1 through 11. And if you're able, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word this morning? Romans 5, verses 1 through 11. And the Apostle Paul writes, he says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into his grace in which we stand, and we exult in the hope of glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that our tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved by the wrath of God through him. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall now be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for what Paul teaches us so clearly in this text. Uh, These words remind us of how you have restored that relationship with us that you designed us for. And we just pray, Lord God, that as we walk through this text this morning, that you will enable us, Father, to see your grace and your love in a way that maybe we haven't before. As you change us and mold us into the men and women of God you create us to become, use this time for your purposes. May you be exalted and lifted up through it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May be seated. You know, sometimes in life, uh, when we look at salvation, a lot of times people look at it differently. And sometimes if we're not careful, we can kind of look at salvation like, okay, God's going to fix us up a little bit. He's going to kind of, you know, clean us up and maybe dust us off and, you know, make us into better human beings. And while part of that is true, it's a little deeper than that. God is changing us at our core through salvation. It's about transformation. It's about, he doesn't just fix us up on the outside. He completely remakes us from within. He's changing our character. He's transforming us. And he is completing us and making us to be the men and women he has created us to be. See, when you were created by God, you say, well, not was I? Yes, all of us are created by God. When you were created by God, God has a purpose and a plan for your life. You've heard me say that, and you'll continue to hear me say that as long as I'm around. And his purpose and plan will be fulfilled the more you surrender to him and allow him to lead you on the path that he has for you. But in order for you and I to receive that, We have to surrender a little bit of who we are to what God wants. Because my plans for my life, maybe your plans for your life, don't always line up with what God has designed us for, do they? Sometimes it's a little different. Sometimes we've got a a dream and a vision and a future for our lives. And I'm sure that I look across the room, I'm sure anybody out here had a dream when they were growing up that they were going to be a professional athlete? I'm just wondering, besides me. Then, 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 Then high school basketball showed up. But anyway... I already started middle school, to be honest with you, but that's when I found out for sure that I was not going to be a pro athlete, you know. Or you might have had a dream. I can remember early on, I thought I was going to one day be a fireman. I don't know why. I'm scared of heights, so I'm not really sure what that would have been, how I would have been on the ladder, but that was my thought. Or maybe a pilot, you know, or an astronaut. That was kind of in, growing up in my generation, a lot of people, and even still, you know, want to be an astronaut and think that, you know, we have these visions of who we'll be. But, you know, God has a vision of who he wants you to be. He, has, he looks at you, he knows how you've been made because he's made you. He's designed you and has a purpose and he designed you for a, a cause that he is going to use you for for the sake of the kingdom. Part of why we wanted you to see that video during the praise time earlier that you saw was to see the diversity of the kingdom of God. People are different cultures, different looks. We are all different, amen? And that's a good thing. I don't want everyone to look like me. That would be scary. Amen. I I figured I'd get an amen out of that one. Yeah. 
But uh, the reality is that our Creator has designed each of us not just to look different, but to be different and to serve Him in a different way because of the way He has made us, the way He has wired us. There are certain things about you that you like and you gravitate towards, right? Things that you appreciate in life, things that just kind of draw you and you're ready to go. That's because you've been designed that way. And there are certain types of people that gravitate towards you, don't they? And you, you know, there's, there's types of people that you just really enjoy being with. And it's not a bad thing. It's not, it's, it's just, that's just the way you are. There's, you know, there's just, that's just the way it is. And maybe God has made you that way so that you can be the light to those that you gravitate towards or gravitate towards you. And what he's wanting us to understand is how complete we are in him and what he's trying to do for us. And he begins this text by trying to remind us how we've been justified by faith. We're not justified by going to church. We're not justified by taking the Lord's Supper. We're not justified by being good people. We are justified by faith. And that is how we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Did you see that? Our relationship is restored and made right with God, not because of anything you or I do, because of everything that Christ has done on the cross and by his redemption for us. Now we have been made right with God. Now the relationship that God designed us for is restored because of what Jesus has accomplished for us. And we are now can be the men and women of God he has created us to become. We are now complete. We're not missing a part of us. Some of you who may have been a little later in coming to Christ can understand that probably a little better than some of us who came at a younger age. You might have had a time where there was kind of felt like in your life, you hear this a lot from people, there was something missing in my life. It wasn't, you know, things, it wasn't that it was a bad person, just like there was something that wasn't quite there. And that something was a relationship with Christ. And when you found, when you, didn't, you didn't find him, he wasn't lost, but when you were brought back together in that relationship, when God restored that relationship to Jesus Christ, you sensed that thing or whatever it was in your life, that hole that you had in your life that was in the way is now filled with what it needs to be filled with. Because you were created to have a relationship with God. Did you know that? You're created to know him. And that's why you're only complete with him. You're in his presence. You're worshiping him. You're experiencing all that he has for you. And you begin, to, he be, you begin to understand why you are here, why you are made because of him and because of what he's done. And Paul wants us to understand as we look at this text of what that looks like, that we have this peace with God through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand. How many of you are grateful for the grace that God has shown you? All of us should be. What we deserve and what he gives us are two different things. In another text in Romans, it says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's part of the Romans road that we know to salvation, but it, it teaches us that truth. We are all, all of us have something wrong with us. It's called sin. It's a, it's a character flaw, too, and it's something that we've inherited. It's, it's not just what we do. Have you, have you ever noticed there's sometimes that you have a hard time doing the right thing? And I love it when people say, well, you know, they try to design things. So we'll trust in the goodness of human nature to let people work things out. That never happens, does it? Because selfishness and greed and, and other things about us that are there under the surface sometimes, we're sometimes able to push them down. They come forth and people just act that way. And sometimes people act kind of strange. Have you noticed that? If you've not, the next time you're on 270 heading towards D.C., do you notice a little selfishness going on out there? Anybody? And we can get into it. I mean, all of us can. You know, we're getting for position. It's, it's kind of like that old lunchroom when you were in grade school, when you really thought school lunches were good, maybe, before you realized they weren't. And everybody rushes down to that cafeteria line, and there's pushing and shoving, and, you know, we're trying to get to be first, right? Whatever that means. That's part of that sin nature that we struggle with, isn't it? That self-preservation that selfishness that can guide us, it can lead us in that direction. And what he's trying to tell us here is that God is delivering us from that. And rather than focusing upon what we can obtain, we focus on what God has desired to accomplish through us. And then in verse 3, he shares that great line. He says, not only this, do we exult in our tribulations. This is what tribulation brings. We think tribulation just brings trouble. But he says, tribulation will bring about what? Perseverance. Perseverance brings about proven character, proven character, hope. And what about, what kind of hope are we talking about? Not the hope that politicians talk about. No, the hope that comes from God. And that hope never disappoints, he says. Because it's not a hope about circumstances. It's a hope that ascends beyond circumstances. 
Because as you follow Christ, there may come days when you find yourself in a situation that is not very encouraging. In fact, it may be dangerous. And you may wonder if you're going to get through it. And maybe you are not going to get through it in this life. Maybe that's the end. Happens to many believers. And you wonder, God, why have you put me here? Why am I walking through this? And he's like, but yet we have a hope. In John chapter 16, Jesus is talking to the disciples, and the disciples are all worried about what's going to happen. I guess they were watching the news. I don't know. I'm, they didn't have the news then. But they were hearing all these bad things were going to happen. They were worried about what was going to happen to the Romans, that they were going to come in and kill everybody. It was going to be a bad scene. They were, for some reason, they were fretting about circumstances in life. And Jesus tells them something in, verse, in verse, chapter 16, verse 33. What does say? You know, in the world you have tribulation. Would anybody agree with that? You will have trouble, you have problems. In the world, you'd have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. The hope that you have in Jesus Christ literally transcends the troubles that you face in this life. It doesn't make them go away. It doesn't smooth them over. It doesn't miraculously kind of, you know, just push them to the background, but it reminds you of the proper perspective that you and I need to have towards life, that Christ is the answer and he is our hope. That he is the one to whom we look when we go through difficult times, when we go through struggles and challenges, he carries us through. And he doesn't leave us. He doesn't walk away from us. He doesn't say, well, I hope you can handle this. I'll see you later. Let me know how it works out. He walks with us through those difficulties and trials. And Paul is wanting these believers to understand that as he's speaking to them. And, you know, when this is written, it's written before a lot of the persecutions take place in Rome. Paul himself probably died sometime in the late 50 A.D., Era is kind of what we guess. Uh, he was murdered, and uh, well, he was beheaded for being a follower of Jesus Christ. Is basically what happened to him. But he wants these believers in Rome to understand that their hope comes not from anything else, but from Jesus Christ. And I think in a world in which we live that sometimes has a little bit of trouble and tribulation, a little bit of fear and frustration. We need to remember that Jesus Christ is that rock on which we stand. He is the hope that guides us, that no matter what we face, no matter what it looks like for us, he is Lord. When the dust settles, when everything seems like it's all over, Jesus stands. The purposes of God will be accomplished. Not because we will them to, not because we organize or program, but because they are whose purposes? God's purposes. And God always accomplishes his purposes. He always gets done what he knows needs to be done. Not because we want it to happen, but because of who he is. And as we follow him, as we learn to surrender to him, as we allow him to live through us, we are made complete by his presence in our lives. What makes you different as a Christian isn't the fact that you go to church on Sunday and dress up and smell better. It isn't the fact that you know a few verses to some courses. It isn't the fact that you know scripture. What, is, makes, what makes you different is that the living God of the universe indwells you through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that? The Holy Spirit, that's, that's a promise from scripture. When we become followers of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is God, right? You understand that? It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Father. They are all God. He comes in and dwells you. That's what Pentecost was about. He comes in and now is living in you and enables you to experience God's presence every moment of every day. You don't escape him. He's with you. And as he does that, he begins to transform you, not just the way you look or the way you act, but your character, your thoughts. The more you surrender and the more he can begin to change you to become more like Christ. Because that's the goal, isn't it? The goal is not to be a better Baptist or whatever label we want to throw on it. The goal is to be a follower of Christ, to look like Jesus, maybe not physically, but definitely through our character and through our spirit. That's why he says here, as he, I love these, these two verses that towards the end. He says, in verse 6 and 8, he says, For we, while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Have you ever thought about the timing of Christ, of Jesus' life on earth. Have you ever thought about that for a minute? Why did he come then? I'm sure the people, uh, the, the Jews in Babylonia were hoping he would have come sooner. They were waiting for the Messiah while they were stuck in captivity, right? 
I'm sure there were many times in the Jew, history of the Jews they would have liked for Jesus to come. Why didn't he wait till later? Why then? Why the history? Why in all of history did he come in the middle of the Roman Empire at that era? Why? Because it was the right time. If you don't believe it was the right time, I wish I could think of the name of the gentleman that wrote. He wrote a whole, basically a book about why it was the right time, about all the different things that came to be. You realize in the Roman world, when Jesus came, they had the only road system that had ever been developed. I mean, our own road system is modeled after the Roman road system that the Romans developed. Travel from here to there, it was a very, not just pretty complicated system of roads. Now, granted, they didn't have automobiles. They had chariots or mostly feet. This is how they got around most of the time. They walked or whatever. But they had this ability. And most of the Roman Empire spoke the same language. Did you know that? Koine Greek was almost a universally understood language. Now, there are others. I mean, this is a vast empire with a lot of different culture groups, but a lot of people understood, enough people understood Koine Greek that that was the language they were able to use to communicate. You think that was an accident? I think all those things coming together, there's other things. I don't have time to get into everything. There's a lot of different things about that era that make it fit just right to what God wanted to do. And sometimes in your life and my life, we have times like, God, when are you going to do something? When are you going to move? We need you to move now. Don't you understand where we're at? Don't you understand what's going on, Lord? Don't, don't you get it? Don't you realize how foolish that sounds? Because I do it, so I know, you know, I, I say things like that to God. I say, God, aren't you ready to do something now? And he's like, at the right time, I will move. Because he always knows when the right time is. And look at verse 8. God demonstrates his love for us that while we were what? We were sinners. What does that mean to be a sinner? It means you have rebelled against God. It means, you have, it means you are separated from God. It means that you are not a part of what God has. You are not a part of his will. You are separated because you, basically a sinner is someone who wants what they want and that's it. And pretty much that fits humanity, doesn't it? We're that way. That's our default mechanism. We kind of go to that. We want the way we want it. We want it our way. It's all about us. It's about no one else but us. We can do that, and any one of us can fall into that. And while we get sinners, what happened? Christ died for us. But God demonstrates his love that while we get sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to get it right. He didn't wait for us to get close. He didn't wait for us to kind of develop the perfect religious system or to become better people. As we were, flaws and all, he came for us. I don't know how many times I've heard it in sharing, when I share my faith with people, you know, I'm, I'm not ready. Preacher, I get called that a lot. I don't know why. I didn't know it was my name. I thought my name was Mike, but I get called preacher. I don't know why. I'm not ready because, you know, I've got some things to work out. Okay, really. What is there about your life that you can change? You know, it's like you've got to make yourself right and better so God will want you. That's the idea that a lot of people have is that they're not good enough for God. And that's true. None of us are good enough for God. That's absolutely true. But you know what? You know what the good news is? He wants us anyway. He doesn't wait for us to clean ourselves up, to fix ourselves up, to make ourselves this and do all these wonderful things to make sure we're ready. It's not like getting ready for a date Remember, guys and ladies, when you get ready for that first date, how you fix yourself up? It's not about making a good impression. What it's about is realizing he takes you as you are. That's the kind of love that he has for you and for me. And because of, what, of that love, because of that power, he is able to then do the work in us that makes us into the men and women of God that he has created us and designed us to become. He makes us complete. He makes us exactly who we're supposed to be for his purposes. Now, to get to that point doesn't happen instantly. It's not like, like you know, waving a magic wand and zap, there you are. It's, it takes time because there's this thing in our, remember I, we talked about sin earlier, and we have that struggle with self-will and that desire for self and survival, and so we, we have to kind of surrender that. Paul talks about that. He talks about putting yourself to death, denying self to follow Jesus. What it means is to, to surrender your will and say, okay, God, not my will, but your will. And we have to have that conversation daily, maybe many times a day. Because the enemy keeps telling us, he keeps saying, oh, no, you don't want to follow God. If you follow God, this will happen or that will happen. It'll be a bad thing for you. You don't understand. If you follow God, it won't work out so well for you. That's what he wants you to believe. He wants you to, this could happen or that. And he comes up with a list that you, that you roll through your mind. Oh, God, if I follow you, all these things could go wrong. 
Yeah, that's a possibility. But what if I don't follow him? What if I choose to stay on my path or a quasi, and most believers in the world, especially in the United States and in, in the West, we kind of follow Jesus kind of haphazardly. We kind of follow him when it's convenient, when we feel good about it, when it makes us happy. But when times get tough, we're kind of struggling. Like, I'm not sure, God, but he's saying, I want you to follow me no matter what you face. Because in me, you will find everything you need, Jesus says. You will find enough when things are going well, but even when things are not <clears throat> going according to plan. When it seems like your world is caving in, it seems like everything is over, he can be that source. His presence in your life gives you a sense of peace and, <clears throat> and a frog in my throat here. Peace and confidence to move forward. It's not because of who we are. The gospel is not about us. It's about God's purposes for us. It's about Jesus and what he accomplishes. And we are the blessed recipients of the gospel and the good news. He, we are the ones that get changed and transformed and get to receive what God has for us. But it all begins and ends with God and what he accomplishes in us through Christ Jesus on the cross. And in that relationship, now we are complete. We have that sense of moving forward of where God wants us to be. And God can do in and through our lives what he desires to do the more you surrender to him. Last night, we didn't have a big crowd last night for Saturday Night Living, but that's okay. We had the ones that need to be here were here last night. But last night, our theme was grace. And I'm just kind of piggybacking on because a lot of you weren't there, so I figure I can share this anyway. That's good, right? One of the things that Don shared last night was the story of a guy named John Newton. Do you know who that is? You should. You sing his song regularly, probably. You've heard it, if you've lived very long, probably a hundred or a thousand times in your life. How many of you know what John Newton did before he became a pastor? Anybody? You know. What did he do, Dave? He was a slave trader. That's what he did. And he was not a very nice person. There's a lot of things we could say. I'm not going to get into all that. But the reality was he was really messed up. But through that experience and through the work of someone else, God drew him to himself and God changed him to be one of the great evangelists and pastors of England. And also interconnected his life with a young man he began to mentor and disciple named William Wilberforce. Now, do you know that name? You should. William Wilberforce was a, a statesman. He was also an ordained minister. And because of his passion, because of his leadership, slavery ended in England. That horrific, inhumane, I can't come with enough bad words to describe what slavery was. It ended. But it had its heartbeat, its beginning in a relationship with Christ that changed a man and changed another man and eventually got to these shores and changed our hearts and got us where we needed to be. Not completely, but where we, at least with that issue, we dealt with that issue. And it was a practice that you know that had been going on in, in human society for thousands of years. You know that, don't you? And the gospel stands completely against it. But I think of that change. And out of that change in John Newton's life comes that song, Amazing Grace. Ever heard it? Who's, who here has not heard Amazing Grace? Have you ever really listened to the words of that song? I'm not going to sing it to you. I like you too much. Look at the words sometime to that. And think about what that means. And how that changed a guy like John Newton, all the things that he was doing wrong, into a pastor of the gospel, into one who ended up being a key, key part of destroying a horrific practice in our culture. Because the power of the gospel is just that strong, folks. It changes us. You are only who you can become. Everything you can become. You, you know, I'll be able to say, I wanna, I've heard this, I want to be this, you know, whatever. I want to be the person that God has created me to be. Well, that's good. But how do you become the person that God has created you to be? Well, you go to church. Well, that's a start. But it's bigger than that. 
You become the person God has designed you to be by surrendering your will to God's will. And that is something you have to do every day. I wish, you could, I wish we could just have one, we could get it all done this morning. We have an altar call. Everybody come, we surrender, we're done. Yay, it's over. That would be great, wouldn't it? But how many of you know that doesn't work for very long? Because the enemy comes back at us again. We have temptations, we have issues. That, that selfishness rises up again. That pride rises up again. And each day we have to deny self and follow Jesus. That is the only way that you and I will be the men and women that we have been designed to be. It's the only way is that complete and total surrender to him. It's pretty much what Paul says in another text. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul says this. Every man in Christ is a new creation. Not a fixed up one. Not a, you know, washed over one, but a brand new creation. When Christ comes into your life, he completely remakes and remolds you. He changes you from within and makes you into the man or woman God wants you to be. Now sometimes that takes a little while to get used to. There are some growing pains, there are some challenges, but that's where the journey begins. And his purpose in your life is not to make you a better Baptist, but to make you more like Jesus. And why would he want to do that? So that others may know Jesus, right? Because isn't the goal, what's the goal of this church? Just to be here and gather on Sunday morning and sing a few good songs so we can go home and feel better about ourselves? We've, we've fulfilled that box for the day. Is that what it's about? I hope not. If that's all it is, then we might as well close the doors and do something else on Sunday morning and sleep in. If that's all it is. It is so that you and I will surrender more of our lives to the will of our Father and follow him outside of these doors and be the men and women of God he's created us to become. That's what it's about. It's about that kind of transformation. God wants to do something with your life. And the only way it happens is when you surrender your will to his. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for the faithfulness of the apostle as he so clearly and eloquently proclaims the truth of who you are and what you've done. I pray, Lord God, that you use this time in our service that if one here today has not responded to you, in that life-transforming surrender of salvation, that today would be the day that that individual man, woman, boy, or girl would give their life completely to you, that you might have sway in their lives. Father, bless this time and use it, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.